In chapter 13.4, we're going to talk about the kind of conceptual level of antimicrobial therapy. Um, we have this important concept of selective toxicity that we'll talk about. Um, we'll talk about spectrums of activity and the clinical importance of that. And then uh, the effectiveness of an antibiotic, how that's tested. Um, and then talk about minimum inhibitory concentrations. Then we will talk about the chemotherapeutic index. Okay, so let's look at a case history. We have three-year-old Molly. She's brought into the ER. Uh, she has a stiff neck and is crying and has a high fever. We've seen this before, right? Uh, we suspect meningitis. So we take a, a spinal tap and look at the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, remember, normally it should be clear, but uh, if there's an infection, there tend to be a lot of white blood cells in there. They find gram-negative rod bacteria in here, and they suspect meningitis because of this. So they immediately prescribe intravenous ampicillin. This immediate giving of antibiotics is called empirical therapy. Uh, it's usually done in the worst case scenarios. Obviously, she has very high fever, um, clearly has an infection of the cerebrospinal fluid, which is very dangerous and is very young. So we're going to give antibiotics right away, even though we don't know exactly what microbe it is um, or precisely how well the antibiotics will work. That takes time, so uh, she begins to improve within hours. That's how quick antibiotics can work and is released after two days. Uh, just before she left, the microbiology lab is able to confirm that it was Haemophilus influenza and that it was indeed susceptible to ampicillin. Uh, so in this case, we use something that generally affects gram negatives, ampicillin. Um, if she had not been getting better, they would have switched to new antibiotics. And this testing would have informed them as to what they would have needed to switch to if she was not improving. So this is kind of the balance here. Uh, we generally start treating right away if it's life-threatening, like this was. Um, but we also want to confirm to make sure that if things don't improve, we maybe need to switch to a different antibiotic. So here's an example of uh, an antibiotic test strip here, and uh, it shows kind of the concentration of the antibiotic. And this is on a lawn plate, of course. So you can see at the highest concentrations, we have large zones of inhibition. And as the concentration decreases, the inhibition decreases as well until we get down to uh, the level that we call the minimum inhibitory concentration. We'll talk about this in just a moment uh, with uh, a different example. So antibiotics work on the principle of selective toxicity. That selective toxicity means that uh, they will target bacteria without being toxic to eukaryotic organisms. Some people call this the magic bullet concept. It will kill the bacteria without killing the patient. Um, broader spectrum right antibiotics are for bacteria broader we talk about antimicrobials um, these are chemical compounds um, generally we find them in nature so one microbe might make them to kill another microbe while not killing themselves um, we can often uh, modify these or synthesize them uh, in a laboratory to make what we call chemotherapeutic agents um, so antibiotics are one class of antimicrobials. Remember, for this course, antibiotics will specifically kill bacteria. The spectrum of activity is the range of organisms that an antibiotic works on. This could be very narrow. It could be just gram negatives or specific gram negatives, or it could be very broad. It works on all bacteria. Um, we use different things at different times because some antibiotics do have side effects on patients. So you can see here, uh, a child had an infected wound here, and after just a few days of antibiotic therapy, the wound has uh, recovered and the infection has gone away. In the past, before the discovery of antibiotics, this would have likely killed this child. So this has kind of revolutionized medicine and increased life expectancy dramatically. Uh, there are 
considerations with antibiotics. Some patients are allergic to certain antibiotics. Um, sometimes antibiotics release toxic byproducts. And uh, other times they don't always kill the microbe. They might inhibit the microbe. And then we rely on a patient with a healthy immune system, which is not always the case, right? Um, remember back to the case study where we had the, a person who was on dialysis who was elderly and had a weakened immune system and uh, antibiotic resistance kept evolving. So these are all factors that go into antibiotic choice. Testing of antimicrobial compounds um, can be done in various different ways. Here is a series of liquid cultures. They all have uh, probably some bacteria in them, and they range in the concentration of uh, our uh, chemical that is added to them. So uh, this could be an antibiotic or something like that. So this is an in vitro test. In vitro literally means in glass, so it means outside of a living organism. So we could test for antibiotic effectiveness here. Uh, you can see at high concentrations all the way down to one uh, microgram per milliliter, it inhibits the growth of the bacteria. Below one microgram per milliliter, here's 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and so on, it does not inhibit the growth of the microbe. So this one uh, microgram per milliliter is our minimum inhibitory concentration. That is important to know because that uh, factors into how much we need to prescribe to a patient. And we'll talk about the considerations to take uh, into account when we talk about patients. Now, this is an inhibitory concentration. It doesn't mean that it's killed all of those microbes. There is a different test called the minimal uh, bactericidal concentration. Um, how little is needed to kill the bacteria that are in here. That requires further testing. We have to take the cells out and figure out if they can uh, grow and divide uh, to see if they've been killed. So that is less commonly done. The minimum inhibitory concentration is going to be different for different species um, of bacteria, and some antibiotics will not work at all on certain species. There is a kind of quicker, dirtier way to do this um, called the Kirby-Bauer assay or the disc diffusion assay. Uh, we will do this in the lab, and um, you can see here there are little cotton discs that are impregnated with different antibiotics and they have different strengths of antibiotics in here. So uh, this is probably vancomycin, this is penicillin, uh, so on and so forth. And um, you can see here uh, we have two replicates and these plates probably have different bacteria on them. So in this one, penicillin works quite well, but on this plate, whatever bacteria this is, penicillin is not working very well, neither is tetracycline. But uh, Vancomycin still works. Uh, this is probably rapamycin, I think. Um, so we can compare. So this is often used for specific clinical isolates. So uh, one phenomenon that occurs more regularly now is patients come in with a unique strain of bacteria that is infecting them. So you have a patient that has, I don't know, um, an infected uh, wound on their arm or something like that. You could take a swab of that, streak it on this plate, and then apply these discs. And that will tell us specifically whether the uh, exact strain in the patient is susceptible to specific antibiotics. So these zones, these clear zones here, are called zones of inhibition. And they get measured. We will do this in the lab. Uh, the larger the zone, the more inhibition, although there are some caveats to that because different discs have different strengths of antibiotic in them. Um, the, the zone of inhibition, uh, the larger it is, the, the less of the drug it takes to uh, kill the bacteria. So that means the bacteria is more sensitive to the antibiotic. If there is no zone of inhibition or very little, uh, it is resistant to that antibiotic. So we can test multiple antibiotics and then prescribe the correct one to the patient's specific infection. So these zones of inhibition, uh, you have to factor in the um, amount of the drug that is in the disc. And this has to do with the kind of... Um, 
common dosages of drugs that are given um, and how much you can give a patient. Some of these uh, get toxic to patients at very high levels. So uh, we can only prescribe them certain amounts. Um, so you can see here uh, for Staphylococcus aureus, uh, the ampicillin disc, if the zone of inhibition is less than 12 millimeters, we call that strain resistant. If it's between 12 and 13, it's got intermediate resistance. And if it's uh, larger than 13 millimeters, we call that strain susceptible to that antibiotic. And there are groups that test this for um, all these different antibiotics so that when you go in, a clinical microbiologist can quickly do this test and report back what antibiotic works best. So whether an antibiotic works or not, so. If you get a zone of inhibition, that's great, but can it actually work in a patient is our other question. This is whether an antibiotic is clinically useful at all. Um, that's determined by the drug concentration that we can get in a patient's body. Uh, it has to be greater than the minimum inhibitory concentration, right? Uh, so if you can only get so much drug into a patient and it doesn't reach that minimum inhibitory concentration, it's not going to inhibit the growth of the bacteria. So there's no use giving the drug. Also, we have to consider uh, kind of the tissue levels of the drug and how they drop over time. So uh, as drugs go into your body, they get metabolized in various ways. Um, some have very what we call quick half-lives. That means they are excreted from your body very rapidly. Um, that is negative uh, in some cases, but other times we just then have to re-administer uh, the antibiotic. Um, so here's, here's serum concentration in micrograms per milliliter of a specific antibiotic. You'll see that uh, the concentration peaks very, very early. Um, and this here is the minimum inhibitory concentration. So uh, for, let's see, about seven or eight hours, the drug stays at a concentration that's high enough to be inhibitory to bacterial growth. But below this time, it drops below that level. So a patient would have to take this antibiotic every seven or eight hours to keep the level high enough to keep inhibiting there. So uh, that can be difficult if they readminister it. Um, so th there's different trade-offs for different drugs. Um, and this is only good if there are no side effects here. If taking this high of a level of the drug causes severe side effects, like worse than the infection, then it's a poor antibiotic. So these all go in and are factored and are studied in a field called pharmacology, which is the study of drugs and how the body processes them. So this leads us to a couple of terms uh, as to whether an antibiotic is clinically useful. Uh, we have the therapeutic dose. This is the minimum dosage per kilogram of body weight that stops growth. So this is an important factor. Different people have different sized bodies, and that means that we need to give them different doses of drugs. You're probably aware that children generally get a different dose than adults, but adults can vary by huge amounts, right? Um, we can have adults that weigh 110 pounds all the way up to adults who can weigh in excess of 500 pounds, right? The amount of antibiotic or drug that they need to get needs to be related to their body mass. Um, and then we have to factor in the toxic dose, the maximum dose that can be tolerated by a patient. Um, this is different for every drug. So the ratio of toxic dose to therapeutic dose is called the chemotherapeutic index. The higher this is, so the more it takes to be toxic and the less it takes to be therapeutic, the better the drug is, the safer it is for the patient. Now we've been talking about antibiotics as if they work singly in a vacuum, but this isn't always the case. Sometimes patients have polymicrobial infections where they have many uh, different microbes that are in there and they might have gram positives, they might have gram negatives. So you may need to apply two or more antibiotics. This comes into a, a kind of an interesting field 
uh, where we talk about how drugs interact with one another. And there are two terms I would like you to know. I would like you to know synergism and antagonism. So combinations of antibiotics can either be synergistic or antagonistic. So let's, let's define those. Synergistic drugs have greater effectiveness when used together. So uh, when combined, it's greater than either individually. So if one inhibited uh, slightly and the other inhibited slightly, when you put them together, they don't just both inhibit slightly, they inhibit way better than either did singly. Uh, so it's greater than their additive effects. There are various reasons that this can happen. An example of this is Aminoglycosides and vancomycin are synergistic together. The opposite is also true. This is when uh, drugs interfere with one another. They can decrease effectiveness. This would be antagonistic interactions. Uh, penicillin and macrolides are uh, one example that inhibit one another. This is as deep as we're going to talk about it. There are whole fields of pharmacology that talk about why this happens and the mechanisms, but this is uh, as deep as uh, we're going to go on that topic. So these are all factors that play into what antibiotics get prescribed and used and how we discover them and things like this. In the next section, we will talk about how some antibiotics actually work to inhibit growth or kill microbes. So to sum it up, we have antimicrobial agents. These are produced naturally by microorganisms or we synthesize them in the lab. They have selective toxicity. That's the ability to, uh, in the case of antibiotics, attack unique components of microbial physiology that are uh, missing or distinctly different in eukaryotic physiology. So I think by now in this course, you've probably heard me say this a lot of times. We use antibiotics to target differences between us and bacteria, right? That is what this statement is saying. It's just using fancy language. There are spectrums of activity. Certain antibiotics will work on certain microbes. Uh, we will see this distinctly in the lab, but uh, remember those two plates I showed on a previous slide. Uh, one antibiotic, penicillin, was working on one uh, plate, but not for the other organism. So different antibiotics work on different bacteria. Uh, we have cytal agents and static agents. Uh, cytal kills, static inhibits growth, and relies on the immune system to deal with it. Minimum inhibitory concentration. This is the concentration of a drug that will stop growth. And then bactericidal concentration, minimum bactericidal concentration, can be calculated with different experiments. Um, and we can measure MIC by those serial dilutions, or you can approximate it using those disc diffusion techniques. All right, that's it for 13.4.